I have a secret to share with you. I have a superpower. And I'm going to share it with you today. Do you want to know what it is? I can walk through fire. I was always fascinated with superpowers when I was growing up. I used to watch Wonder Woman on my 13-inch black and white TV. Do you remember those? <laughs> Dating myself. Last year, I got to take my daughters to see her on the big screen. It was awesome. And when I saw her walking across that barren wasteland of a battlefield, fighting off enemy bullets and fires popping up all around her, and all she was armed with was her shield and her courage and her love, I thought, now I want to get me some of that. When I was growing up, my mother used to invite me to slide my finger through the open flame of a candle. Yeah, I know, most people hang around the dining room table playing gin rummy or scrabble. My family, we literally played with fire. Now, given my childhood to this point, not a shocker. But it was still fire, so I only grazed the tip of the flame. Seeing this, my mother said, it's not where you touch it that matters. It's how long you hold your finger in the fire. Well, I like a challenge. So I lit a lot of candles to practice to see just how slowly I could move my finger through the flame. The slower I went, the more powerful I felt. But I never left my finger there to burn. I wished I'd known then how this understanding could have served me in my relationship to emotional pain. I was handed my first hurts really early on. The first time my mother saw my father beat me, I was eight, eight weeks old. My mother began sharing stories with me of my early abuse when I was old enough to listen, but not old enough to understand. By the age of five or six, I'd already started thinking of myself as the bad, unlovable victim. And victims get stuck in pain. When we get hurt, we want someone to tend to our wound and to step up and protect us from being harmed again. When no one does this for us, we can get stuck in the pain and we can attempt to protect ourselves by being ready for the next one or smart enough to avoid it or just plain hiding behind a 15-ton concrete wall. A wall of what? A wall of pain. Holding our pain close, we torment ourselves. Long after they stop, we continue turning our pain into suffering. How? Think about it. When we shove our pain inside, what happens? It looks like sadness and despair, fear and anxiety. What happens when we push it out into the world? It shows up as anger and judgment, hostility and rage. We end up hurting ourselves and others with the pain handed to us. Just look at the news. We are inundated with stories of pain creating more of the same. Mass and domestic violence, child abuse, sexual assault, and debilitating mental unwellness. There are agencies tasked with tracking and treating our pain who tell us that between 2009 and 2016, over half of mass shootings were committed by perpetrators of domestic violence that one in four women will be domestically, a victim of domestic violence in her lifetime, that every nine seconds a woman is abused in the U.S. That means that during my time on this stage, nearly 100 women will be abused in the U.S. Let that sink in. 100 women. And that says nothing of the children in their care. And speaking of the children, one in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually assaulted as children. There are 123 suicides per day in the U.S., and 90 people per day are dying from opioid abuse. Pain and our broken relationship to it are literally killing us. 
Pain almost killed me too. My father's rage was lethal, especially when he felt weak. Like when my mother laughed at him. You never laughed at him. Beating, then raping us, made him feel stronger. Yes, us. I was a toddler the first time he violated my tiny body, and I have the scars to prove it. Knowing his violence, and even after she got safely away from him, she continued to send me to him alone for more of the same. Over the years, distracted by her own dramas, her own pain, my mother failed to act like one. There was a string of lonely, broken men she introduced me to and told me to visit, to console, all by myself. Like the elderly widower who asked, do you like it this way? As he mounted my six-year-old body and bought my silence with a book and a butterscotch candy. Or the neighbor who slid my hand through the zipper of his work trousers to help him coax his pet turtle from its shell. I was in second grade. And then there was my father. Unlike me, my father was quite the artist. He sent me this hand-drawn card from jail while doing time for drug-related crimes. He said it was me on the phone. I was 15. By this point, pain consumed me. I was vacillating between terrifying anger and paralyzing despair. I raged. I wept. In some crazy way, I was doing what so many of us with trauma do. I was telling myself that my pain mattered enough to be remembered. So I remembered. I was doing what no one else was doing for me. I was validating my trauma. I was pain, and pain was me. I wish I'd known then that we're not supposed to hold on to our pain, because when we do, they get to keep hurting us by holding us in the fire. And what does fire do? It spreads. Did mine spread? Would you be surprised if I'd made a career out of hurting other people, landed in jail, died young? Probably not. Now, trust me, I fell on my face plenty. But what if I'd done all of that? That would steal my life, not theirs. That was their story, not mine. Their pain did that to me. And that made me angry and downright rebellious. So I asked myself, how do I do better than they did? How do I heal? And then, like some sort of divine intervention, about a decade ago, my book club introduced me to the book, The Shack. The Shack tells the story of a man's unimaginable tragedy turned into his suffering, much like my own. And it used the F word in a way I never had before. Oh, no, not that F word. I know all the ways to use that one. Forgiveness. Like a lot of you, growing up, forgiveness had always been used against me. My parents demanded my forgiveness like an overdue reunion. They wanted me to get over it and to say, come back. When I tried my best to do just that, what do you think happened? That's right, they abused me again. So I stayed angry and hurt, immersed in my pain, their pain. This was no way to live, but forgiveness, as far as I could see it then, was just a door to more hurt and more fire. The shack showed me that I was wrong, that I could be safe from them while still forgiving them, that I had power, superpower, power that comes from choice, because when we have choice, we have power. And that power is available to you too, even if your life didn't look like mine. Perhaps your family member verbally attacks you. Suppose your friend steals from you? What if your coworker takes credit for all the hard work you do and then gets promoted above you? In all three cases, forgiveness can give you what holding on to your pain has been providing with far fewer side effects, safely, powerfully, 
Because forgiveness isn't just about letting go. It's about holding on. Letting go of the pain and holding on not to pain, but to my favorite B word. Nope, not that one. Boundaries. When we forgive, boundaries gives us a choice, telling us how close they can get. One, if they are reasonably safe and we think they won't hurt us again, we can let go of the pain and let them come close again. People make mistakes. Some people change. We can give second chances. Or two, if they are unpredictable or predictably harmful, we can still let go of the pain and keep them at some distance, emotionally and physically. If they are downright toxic, that distance can mean full exile, even if they are family. You see, in either case, we don't need to hold on to the pain. We, we know we went through fire. We survived. We don't have to keep holding hate or hurt, just boundaries. Boundaries become our fire shield, allowing us to walk through and past the flames without letting them consume us. You may not have had any control over what happened to you, but you are in charge of your recovery. You see, forgiveness isn't about them. It never has been. It's not about doing it their way or making them feel good. Forgiveness simply means giving up the fantasy of being able to rewrite your unchangeable past. But you get to decide your present and design your future. So what did I do? I cut my father clean out of my world but only after speaking the truth to him of his soul-shaking abuse of me, forcing him to listen to my pain as I had once felt his. And my mother, she may have been a victim herself, but she was no innocent. She failed to protect me, to stand up for me, and she placed me in danger over and over again. And the other perpetrators, I left them where they were, buried in the past, Finding them and holding them accountable wasn't a necessary part of my healing. In Robert Brault's words, life becomes easier when we learn to accept the apology we never got. Now listen, I won't lie to you, this forgiveness thing was hard. Standing in the fire was awful, but it was also so familiar. It's all I'd ever known. That's why we stay. But walking out delivered my powerful no. No to carrying pain forward. No to being prisoner to my past. No to the role of victim. No to letting those who were damaged and dangerous close enough to leave their pain with me. Forgiveness was not about minimizing my pain or the damage they caused. It was not about granting permission or approval. This new understanding of forgiveness with boundaries simply meant that I could be right about just how wrong they were and still be happy and free. So how do we all make the most out of this short, sweet, big, beautiful life? By using our superpower of forgiveness. Radical, repetitive forgiveness. Because here's the deal. Pain, like fire, is inevitable. It's going to come and sometimes come back. You know, when you find yourself in a situation or a relationship and you just know you've been there before, it's like deja vu, but of the nightmare variety. I suggest at those moments, you go back and forgive something or someone so you can stop recycling that pain. People come into our lives to test our commitment to a life of letting things come and go, just like the tide. Pain exists in the holding on. People have often asked me, how did you survive that? My response, my rage saved me and my forgiveness redeemed me. Part of that redemption was sharing publicly my story of rising up through trauma to help others. When life levels us, it creates little landslides taking away our footing and offering up a new landscape on which to begin again. In these transformations, a wise voice calls out from across the darkness, 
beckoning us to allow pain to teach, not destroy us. That voice told me, you are more than the pain you endure and the pleasure you offer. You are a survivor, a thriver, an inspirer. You will not be crushed by this. This will define you only as much as you let it. You are powerful, more powerful than anyone who has ever or will ever hurt you. You bear the scars, but you will not be the wound. You choose love over hate. You use your pain to fuel your hunger, to know love, to feel peace, and to share it with others. In time, you will find people you can trust to heal you piece by piece. Piece by piece, you will be whole again. I am whole again. Thank you.